Uh, as Paulo said, we're going to talk about this history. What I'm doing is, uh, you know, packing 37 years of, uh, you know, this history because we started in 1982. But I'm going to focus uh, on the training and uh, uh, disintegration of technology to the grid. So what I'm going to do is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, trajectory, academic trajectory, a brief presentation of this evolution, and discuss this training and integration, as I mentioned, and present two, two projects that uh, were the most recently we have done. And I think this one here, the inquiry-based learning, is related to the paper that uh, Rebecca sent to you. So here's my academic, you know, uh, Paulo already mentioned, I am a mechanical engineer. I finished this in 1970 from USP in Sao Paulo. Uh, I was working with computers, you know, number crunching and doing numerical analysis. I went to teach at the University of Campinas, computer science. I stayed there until 1976. Went to MIT in 1973, did a master in education and a PhD in bioengineering and education, working with cerebral palsy kids, doing logo and uh, you know, uh, understanding how they think and how they learn and so forth. Went back to Brazil, this is where I am now. I am a researcher in the ed, the Lucas of Informatic and Supply to Education at UNIK. I am a current professor at Mid Study Department in the Art Institute of the UNIK. And I am associate professor, a collaborator with the uh, uh, graduate program at uh, PUC. That's where our Freire was. Um, so in 1983, I went back to uh, Brazil to recamp. I started this nucleus of informatics applied to education and was created in 1983 as an interdisciplinary research group. So we had people coming from education, the school, uh, technology school, and we were, were supposed to work together to understand how we could do this uh, technology and education. So the motivation for this, the inspiration for this was Papert's constructionism, constructivism or constructionism. So you learn by engaging in doing things with uh, technology, and also incorporated some ideas from Freire, the contextualized knowledge in the sense that uh, whatever you do has to be related to what the, the person does and so forth. This is more or less Freire's idea. So um, that's how that's how we we had the the, the support for the work that we did at this year. So this is a brief presentation of the evolution. Um, uh, this is a uh, document that we produced last year, uh, uh, myself and Beth Almeida. This is a, like a nine-one page. Uh, I give you the reference for this. Uh, we talk about the, poli the politics of uh, technology in Brazil. So you know, I'm you know packing ninety-one pages of this information. So. Um, the evolution I divide in three phases. One phase is when we started, nobody knew anything about technology and education. Uh, it was interesting because we needed like three computers in order to do, three types of computer in order to do some of this work. We had the MSX that we could do logo. We had one computer from Itaú Tech that had uh, Portuguese, we could write Portuguese. And all the apples that they produce never had the uh, characters from the Portuguese. So we never could use that in schools because we could not write Portuguese. So it was kind of funny. You know, poor country, we need three computers in a, in a classroom to do research. Basically, uh, we set up laboratories at universities uh, and work with the teachers. I'm going to say a little bit about this EduCo project and Formar project. The next phase is more or less related to internet, uh, personal computers, set up laboratories at the schools, a lot of online education, and as Paul mentioned, the ProInfo was one of the largest projects that we had, and there are several other ones that are related to ProInfo. 
And the other phase is the laptops and uh, classmates or the OLPC uh, computers. And we talk a lot about mobility. It's interesting that all these phases is related to the political uh, changing the government. This one is uh, related to the dictatorship and getting out of dictatorship. This one here is Fernando Benrique, starting 1996. And this one here is Lula and Dilma. So each government, when they come, they change everything and they start something new. And um, this is part of the, the problem that we have in terms of technology education. <clears throat> so the characteristic of the, the informatics education is a systematic action that started in 1982 and until today. Most is something related to the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Science and Technology. They are the supports and the sponsors of these pro this projects. The idea from the beginning was to integrate technology to the curriculum. We want to uh, somehow uh, change the way you know, you're doing things in the, in the classroom. Um, and then the, most of the work that we did always had the partnership with the universities. So here's the first one. The Ducom project started in 1983. When I got there to Brazil, I jumped into this project. We were writing the proposal for this project, went from 83 to 91. The idea was to create five research centers in Brazil. They want to be in different regions, and they want the centers to do uh, ICTs in different approaches. Um, the study developed different strategies using ICT K-12, and the other thing was to disseminate this knowledge to other centers. So the idea here was to set up seeds of uh, groups, group seeds, to, to spread this information. Uh, throughout the country. So here are the five centers. We had one in Pernambuco uh, with uh, math and text to train teachers, uh, word processor here. Uh, Minas Gerais, for Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, developed education software, a real uh, software and hard for simulations, science applications. Unicamp was Robo, and Urquiz in Rio Grande do Sul was Robo, Computer Science and Education Software. So you see these different regions and the different approaches to using technology in education. The teacher training was most face-to-face, -face, like a partnership between universities and schools, in the sense that we did not know anything about you know, technology in education and also how to work this in a school. So it was very much a uh, you know, working together, collaboration between the university and the schools. So the university research learning about uh, ICT education, you know? uh, research going to school uh, with the teachers to learn together. Teachers work with few students so they could test ideas and see how things could do uh, could be done in general with the schools. And uh, research is from the university and the, the schools are trying to understand how to use technology to do things in the curriculum. So here we have a very interesting um, approach in the sense that it's face-to-face -face and this very, very intense collaboration between university and um, the schools. So this is in all in five centers. This is the same thing. Even though you're doing uh, software education, you're doing you know this way. If you're doing logo, you're doing this way, and so forth. Um, then, since we learn all this stuff, we the government MAC decided to spread this to create other centers because you know just have five. Everybody's complaining. Why five? Why should we have more? So the format uh, project was set up to train educators from uh, all over the country. They're supposed to send two educators for each state. 
They came to Campinas, to Unicamp, for a 306-hour course, face-to-face. -face. It was eight hours per day, 45 days. This was a massacre. You're going to see uh, how this thing was done. Each course involved uh, 50 educators, and participants had to, as part of this course, to make a proposal how to set up a center for informatics education in their state. So here is uh, the, the course. 25 educators in the morning did practice. In the afternoon, they would do theory and you know, exchange. So uh, you know, this is, when I look at this stuff, I mean, this was really crazy, because we were teaching Pascal to these people. Uh, you know, it was very, very uh, intense and, you know, it's not a way of doing stuff, but that's how we, we end up doing this. I'm part of this. I, you know, was running this the course for, for, for men. So problems with this format. The selection was very difficult because each state select educators in a different way. For example, one they did a test to find out who are the best ones to go to this place. Others was like a gift, you know, we work for 25 years now, go to Campinas, you're going to relax. And so we have all kinds of participants. Very heterogeneous group. Since they were appointed by the state, everybody was really concerned, you know, to do a good job so they could, uh, you know, go back and, so everybody was really concerned with evaluation and not changing attitudes. The course did not create opportunity for them to work with students. It was just theory and practice by themselves. And the diversity of uh, ICTs, uh, you know, even conflicting methodologies and pedagogies with this software. So we went to immerse them in the, into this different approach so they could later select what uh, was the best thing for the state and how they could work uh, in these centers for informatics education. So this is uh, end 1991, 93, 97, 96 changed the government. There was uh, Fernando Henrique and he established a uh, the ProInfo first phase started in 1997, 2006. The idea was to set up nucleus of technology and education, they call it there, in states and uh, municipalities, if they want to. Um, the universities train, the different universities train multipliers, like they call multiplicadores, so people that would work in the nucleus of technology and go to school to train teachers and help them to set up technology in the schools, set up laboratories in the schools, train the teachers to use this uh, school laboratory and promote uh, several encounters and, and workshops for these people, you know, like a continuous education for these uh, multipliers. Um, this training strategy here was really interesting because the university was preparing these multipliers to work in the nucleus, uh, combination of face-to-face -face and online. There was a lot of things doing online. The topic was related to technical and pedagogical aspects, and we had practice um, and uh, theories related to these different practice. So, some, some universities had this, the, the, the multipliers learning to work with kids, going to school and trying to do things. And some you know, universities just used this for my approach and gave it like a 306 hour course to these uh, multipliers. Then the multipliers would go to the schools and train the teachers to work with this laboratory that, that was being set up by the, by the government, by the Torinfo government. A lot of, uh, you know, the government was really interested in numbers. So I'm sorry that this is in Portuguese. This is part of the, you know, what's in that uh, document. So number of students that uh, 
participate in this project, number of schools. This is what they, they, the, the goals, and this is what really happened. Number of uh, nucleus set up, multipliers that was uh, trained, so it was you know, a large number. Uh, professors from the, from the schools that uh, were, were trained. Um, even ICT uh, technical people to, to give support to these uh, laboratories in schools. Uh, the school administrator was not part of the plan, but 4,000 of them was uh, uh, prepared. And the number of uh, computers installed in, in, in the schools. Um, the best, best thing that happened with this program is this thing here. The number of multipliers that, we, that was uh, prepared. Because this is very interesting. When you do a project in, with technology and education today, if you, you know, make a phone call in whatever city in Brazil, you have some people, you know, some multipliers that uh, participate in this program and they can help you in the you know, implement, implementation of this project. We have this experience with a very, very you know, obscure city in the state of Pará, for example. Never heard of it. Then we called and there was somebody there that uh, could help us in this, in this project. So problems with phase one of ProInfo, the focus was numbers. Too much decentralized, each university could do anything they want, so we have different results. Lack of technical infrastructure, these laboratories didn't have connections, and sometimes the, the, the computers stay in the box, and you know. Training did not create opportunities for the integration, so you know, using the laboratory was not related to what was happening in the classroom. And uh, so the integration here of technology and curriculum did not happen at all. The second phase is uh, more the, the corporal info integrado. The emphasis now is uh, medias, uh, so different medias, uh, like uh, integrating the uh, photo, the digital photo, and videos, and so forth, with technology, not just computers. Development for media program, which is integrated with different media and the curriculum activities. They create a portal for the teachers, implementation of internet in schools, and then they develop the, the UCA project, one laptop per child, and um, the idea was to really go into the classroom with these uh, technologies. So I'm going to just give a brief presentation of this UCA project because it made a, made a big, big difference from you know, everything we did in terms of use technology in education. Here's some numbers. So we have 27 states. So they you know, bought like 150,000 computers, laptops. They installed this in, in, in schools. The schools uh, select had to be small in terms of uh, the students, like 300, 400 uh, students per, per, per school. Uh, so each state uh, was selected like 10 schools. This was appointed by municipal and state. So we had different types of school, rural school, urban school, you know, schools in communities like Quilombolas uh, uh, and and so forth. Uh, 350 schools uh, was uh, select. Each school had about you know 500 teachers and students, and six cities in the country was every school was part of this project. So every school in that city, they want to understand the impact of this project in the city. So they select very small city with like six, seven schools, and in these schools everybody. Uh, had computers in all the six schools had a you know part of the UCA project. Uh, this is what this project, this pilot project, meant in terms of numbers. So we have uh, uh, 166,000 public schools, uh, 78,000 urban, 90,000 rural, uh, 2.2 million teachers. 
think this number is wrong. He is only nine, nine down. Sorry. Um, we have uh, 47 million students, and these 300 schools that were selected is about 6% of the schools in Brazil. So it's a very, very small pilot project. Um, it's uh, established in, in, in four, we will call four pillars. We had to train teachers to do research because we didn't know anything about how to do education with laptops. So everything was uh, starting again to understand how to use computers in education. Uh, infrastructure, because these schools need to have internet. And uh, they want to do an evaluation because there, are, there was a lot of things about understanding the impact of these projects in the kids and in the schools and in some cities. So this is the computer that was distributed, the classmate from Intel. Uh, there was a problem with uh, OLPC. The, one of the requirements was that computers should be produced in Brazil. And the OLPC, you know, couldn't arrange for a company to do that. So Intel uh, produced this bottle and one of the factories in Brazil produced this computer. That's uh, you know, what the, the, the computer that was distributed to, to the schools. Here is uh, how the training process happened. There was a group of uh, researchers from different universities that were ha helping to design this project. So this group, you know, the researchers of this group became responsible for uh, spreading this throughout the country. So here, for example, this is URGS, responsible for Paraná, Santa Catarina, Rio Grande do Sul, and Amazon. Here is USP. You know, USP is responsible for Sao Paulo, Mato Grosso, and uh, Amapá. Unicamp. Unicamp is responsible for São Paulo, Rondônia, Acre, and Pará. The selection of this was because we had people, graduate students, that moved from you know, our group to other, other, other states and, and so forth. And I'm going to say to you what we did in terms of Unicamp so you understand how this thing was possible. So here is Unicamp. We, we are going to the schools. We had 10 schools divide between USP and uh, PUC and uh, Unicamp. So we had like three, four schools that were responsible. So we could go to the school and do research in the schools, work with the kids and so forth. So, forth. so here is how this thing was set up. And at the same time, we had to work with people from Acre, Rondônia, and Pará. We did this through video conference, helping the universities from these states, so they could, you know, get knowledge and go to the schools to do what we were, you know, were doing in terms of uh, some power. So uh, this is how, you know, this thing was was spread. So here, you know, Ned, you know, goes to these schools in, in Campinas, and we work with the researchers from the local universities so they could go to their school and do research in their state. So this is how uh, this uh, process happened. It's interesting that um, we went back to that model of work with partnership, uh, you know, face to face, and also this is uh, education. Here are some numbers. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is the, the, the thing that was interesting. Everything was going in terms of, you know, laptops in, in, in schools. Uh, so when uh, Dilma, came, uh, I think the minister was uh, uh, Mercadante, and he decided that UCA was not the solution, he started doing like tablets and uh, digital blackboards. So it changed the whole, the whole approach. But you know, uh, continue the education of the, the teachers, uh, you know, media education, and this is what the project UCA produced in terms of uh, preparation of, you know, uh, training of teachers and uh, administrators. 
So I'm going to say, talk a little bit about the uh, inquiry-based learning, which is related to the papers that uh, Rebecca sent to you. So we're using the infrastructure of the UCA project, and we developed this inquiry-based uh, project, uh, which was part of the UCA, for NED, and, uh, and uh, was an extension of the UCA project. So, you know, and it was financed, it was a research project financed by St. So what's the motivation? The motivation was to ask teachers and students, uh, when we go to the schools with, in the UCA project, we ask teachers and, and students, what are you doing with the laptop? And the answer was always in doing research. So, you know, it's kind of funny. Every school you go, you know, you're doing research. So we ought to understand what kind of research you're doing. You can guess what kind of research they are doing. So you go to Google, and, you know. So you go to the, to the school, the blackboard, there was something, and they have to look for this information. So we want to change, you know, we want to produce, do something different about this. Uh, so the inquiry-based uh, uh, project was uh, to do a project-based learning and, uh, and, and have the students more active doing things, not just you know, looking for stuff on the computer, but doing something else with the computers. So um, the objective was to implement this inquiry-based learning approach in schools and help them to understand the impact of this, in this, you know, how to use a computer, how to integrate things into the curriculum, and so forth. Um, we use this, uh, you know, uh, literature. It was a very, you know, very good book that uh, we uh, use as a, a model for, you know, for the support the, the whatever we're doing in terms of theory about this inquiry-based learning. Um, the proposal was to use the inquiry based learning in all grades, first to uh, ninth grade in the schools. And this is what we uh, ask the teachers to do. We, we you know, have teachers from the schools coming to, to the university, present the project, and then ask them to do, you know, to tell us what they understand about science, or what they understand about research, and what they understand about scientific methodology. So they have to write this in a piece of paper you know, and tell us what, what they think about these things. The second activity, we ask them to go to their schools and do the same thing with their students, to ask the same three questions. This was very interesting because some of the first grade teachers said that this was too hard and they, you know, there's, there's no way that the first grade is going to be able to answer these questions. And to their surprise and to our surprise, kids from first grade, first grade kids, students, answer the question, for example, what is to do research? They said, this is what my mother does when she goes to the supermarket. <laughs> and this was a revelation to the, you know, to the teachers. They said, wow, we were underestimating uh, our first grade. And then this happened throughout the whole note. And that's how they jumped into this project, because they saw that you know, the kids could uh, you know, respond to, 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 the, to this, this project in, in the schools. So um, here are the kids answering these questions. So you know, they write a piece of paper, and then we analyze uh, the answers and so forth. And the third activity was to um, the, for the teachers to get a topic from their curriculum, what they're supposed to do, for example, one science teacher was working with planets. In other words, what, what, uh, was working with Indians, and, and you know, uh, Pantanal, and so forth. So this is the topic written in the curriculum. We want them to discuss with the students what they want to learn about whatever, planet or Pantanal and so forth. 
select questions that uh, could be investigated. No, the kid would say, ah, I want to know about uh, how many planets we have. Okay, go to Google and see if you can answer that question. Well, okay, so this is not a good question. Another question, I want to know whether it's cold or hot, in blah. go to Google, Google and see, okay? So when they found questions that they could not be answered by going to Google, so this became a very good question to go to the blackboard, and then they, the students select, either the whole classroom was gonna work with one question, or different groups could work with different questions in the classroom. And then they had to set up experiments to understand or to answer this, this, this question. And sure, you know, using computers and, and so forth. I'm gonna give an example of one activity. Uh, this was a study done in the city around Campinas called Pedreira, one of the schools that participated in this project. So the, the second graders, they are working with uh, Pantanal, to study understanding the ecosystem in Pantanal. Pantanal, do you know Pantanal is from the north, north uh, the south of uh, Mato Grosso. So the, the question was this one. You know, this is the bird that was, uh, represents the, the Pantanal, and the kids want to understand why the leg bent this way. Yeah. They can Google that. Yeah. yeah, you can Google, you can do that and look for this answer. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, show, here is the, I have this thing. By the way, let me see if you can get it. Oh, okay. Uh, you see this uh, in the movie. I think you can see it happening, but you don't know why. Look at the, how they, they, they walk. See? This is not particular, uh, you know, feature of this particular bird. If you watch the birds, all of them do this. Can you guess why? See, this is a very good research question. You know, kids from the second grade are asking this. And this is what, you know, uh, makes this approach very, very interesting because even the university, you know, some of the uh, people from the university working with the, 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 the teachers did not know about this stuff. <laughs> so here are the kids, you know, looking into the computer, and what this means, they found the structure of the 2UU or the bird's legs and understand how this uh, works. Do you want to, can you, um, can you uh, guess what's happening here? You have an idea? Yeah, probably, uh, I think is, is there any particular something? reason why it has, why the knee should be forward or backward? Or well, I mean, this is very, very important. <laughs> well, yeah, but as long as the leg can bend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, for a science teacher, I think this is not a, a good answer, right? And I think this very important thing here about if you fly, when you land, if you bend like uh, our legs like we do, I mean, we'll go like this. And the bird can go like this. Mm -hmm. It's because it's actually the ankle. That's too tight. See, this is, this is here, not here, not the knee. The knee is under the wing. This is part of the evolution, if you know. This flying thing and how to so land. The, the knee is something. inside. The knee is underneath. It's that first bend. That's where the knee is. Yeah, the knee to the right. To the right. Yeah, in the first side. The knee is up. Yeah. The knee is here. Is there? And yeah. here's the. That's just the landing. Yeah. So um, 
you know, you can use that to teach like anatomy because maybe you just think that's how it is. So students can look at the anatomy and understand why we have a knee, what the function it does. So you can have many questions that instead of just because usually you teach anatomy just showing the skeleton and say this is how it is. And nobody questions, nobody asks, and then suddenly it has a function and the reason why it's one of the yeah. So I think that's all. So you said that there was evolution. And so was there a previous there was an ancestor of this bird that didn't have this particular setup? I don't know we really look for that, but I mean we could You use the, the word evolution, right? Yeah. yeah. But I mean it has to evolve from something. You know, you're working with second grade. They had a very difficult time understanding this. <laughs> even, even, you know, because they never saw the bird actually doing this. Uh, so we had models, uh, you know, doing by one of the parents. Uh, they construct this thing, but it was interesting when he brought all this stuff to the school, the knee was like ours. So, you know, and he had the kids setting up the the, you know, these models. You can see that uh, some did exactly like we do, you know, some got it. So, So how, you know, <laughs> trying to understand how the model and then we, we want them to explain how these things happen. So, um, we took this to, to, to the university, we constructed a model with, uh, you know, Lego, and uh, for them to understand how this thing could be possible. So here's the, here's the E, and you see them working here, you know, with, uh, but you know, this uh, thing was probably too abstract to some of the kids to understand about this, uh, this problem. But, uh, this was very interesting because then the university's uh, kids or, you know, are, from our group had to really come up with interesting things for, for them to be able to play with. But it was a very, very interesting, we had all of, you know, but I can show you a lot of examples of very interesting questions they, they had to work with. <laughs> so lessons learned. First about uh, teacher training. So uh, with Educo was very, very interesting. We learned a lot by doing this partnership with universities and schools and it was a very, very interesting moment for us to be able to work with the schools and go into schools and, and uh, play with the teachers and so forth. Very intensive face-to-face course at Formar, which was not very, very productive. Uh, you know, nursing these people in this program was very confusing. Um, the first phase of uh, ProInf, we had a lot of face-to-face -face and online. And, you know, some of this training was effective, some was kind of uh, the same as this Formar and did not produce good results. There is an attempt, attempt in, uh, to integrate uh, ICT and curriculum in the second phase of uh, ProInfo, even though they are working with laboratories, you know, we have to take the kids to the laboratory once a week, and you know, this doesn't mean too much. And uh, when we do, we did the UCA, the one laptop per child and the uh, inquiry project. We went back to this, uh, partnership, university and schools, and also was a very, very interesting moment for the training, for us to learn. Um, so the lesson here is when we're learning, university and schools learning about something, was a very good collaboration and produced very interesting results in terms of training. When we try to disseminate this knowledge, I think it was, we made a lot of mistakes, you know, thinking that it's top down, and, you know, you need to learn Pascal and so forth. It was not a very good uh, strategy for training the teachers. 
In terms of integration, um, we had a lot of integration when we work in the Educom, the first phase, and UCA, uh, the uh, inquiry project. Um, and this integration did not happen in the other phase. You know, because this laboratory at uh, the, the schools, I mean, it's very hard to be able to do this. Uh, another lesson, um, when we work with the schools in, in general, we as researchers, you know, everything, uh, we never ask them what they need. We just uh, give them solutions top down. I think this is something that, uh, still happening in some in some projects is, is for you know, unfortunate this this is uh, the approach that we take. The university think they know everything and the schools, you know, bunch of them, blah blah blah. But we talk about this in, in, in this course. Um, second lesson or you know um, we have this experience from 1982 and you know all kinds of projects and what's missing. And for me, what's missing is a, a policy that uh, involves not only the government, not MEC saying, you know, this is what you need to do. And you know, throwing the stuff at the schools. But it needs to be something that the government society and the education institutions like university they work together in something that can be, you know, very sustainable, and not changing every every government um, that we have in states or, or, or federal. Um, another thing that to me, I, I'm seeing this all over the uh, place, and um, we talk a lot about engagement, especially with this you know, opportunity that we have to carry technology with us and, you know, having uh, these uh, technical facilities today of people <coughs> being, you know, uh, digital uh, included and so forth. Uh, but I, 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 I think it's, it's not the right thing. To me, the right thing is to be embracing the accompaniment. Uh, this is, I think, what's missing when we we work with the schools. I think this is going to be a big, big difference in terms of how we approach the schools, learners, and so forth. Uh, if you want to go into the personal learning uh, process as we're going now, if we don't do this, it's going to be very, very hard to be able to establish this relationship uh, with the learners. Sure. What is the difference? I don't forget here. What is the difference between engaging and embracing? The once you uh, listen to the person, you understand what uh, the needs and so forth, and you find something that's very related. This is you know free, very related to what is, is meaningful to you. Then probably you be engaged in doing or developing whatever. You know, it's significant, meaning to you. So there is a big difference. I mean, it's, it's easy to say, you know, we should engage. But if you don't embrace this person, uh, you're forcing the engagement. Have you, I mean, you're in a university. Yeah. Have you looked at the teacher training program at that university and changed that? The, the first the training, the preparation in, of teachers. In, in, the, in the university. I mean, you've reached out to all these schools and you've done all this stuff. What about the teachers you're training in your own university? You know what I say? It's like trying to straight up a banana. Okay, but that's a, but, but you know, this is a real issue. If you, if you can't do this within your own university, I think that you're trying to correct a problem. It's it's like it's it's like instead of doing preventive medicine, you're spending a lot of money doing corrective medicine. And why don't I mean you don't have the power to attack this in your own university? No. 
I tell you, no. Well, that's a very discouraging. I don't know how you, you know, how you present or how you work with this. Uh, most of the education, I mean, people probably are from, from these centers in Brazil. Uh, at Unicamp, they're very, very much like Marxist ideas and they think technology, whatever we do is like, uh, you know, establishing a relationship with that. They don't listen to us. Probably well, worse than that, they're also not trying to teach it. Well, I can do that in my, you know, my uh, institute. We, we, you know, the art institute or the department where I work, we, we do a lot of this stuff. We proper based learning and, but at, at universities and the, 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 the they school. They do train and, science teachers at the university. Uh, yeah, they have a, a graduate program for doing that. Not undergrad, for the graduate it's program. A master, it's a master's program. Master and doctor program for the science. Oh no, but they don't, when they do undergraduate, undergraduate pedagogia, no, no. pedagogia, they don't train science teachers? No, no, no. pedagogia is pedagogia. Yeah, what about, the, what are, to, to some of the people who take science at the university become teachers? Like it's physics or it's not science, it's yeah. physics, it's all chemistry. Yeah. You go to a physics department and then you go to the, the school of education for yeah. one year. So the, the, the education is school, the education is school. They can participate in producing teachers from physics, from chemistry, from, but they are, there is no, uh, teacher for chemistry is not done is not prepared, is not trained in the school of education. Okay, just right. I think you can keep going with the, with the talk. We'll discuss transforming. Well, I'm not finished. Later. So this is a book that we did. You can find the book here in this address about this uh, ability. This was written by us and the teachers and some of the students also have chapters here. This is the study that I mentioned to you. Uh, you can find it in this uh, uh, link here. That's it. Thank you for having questions.